Hello, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Yes, this is episode one, and we hope to have many, many more. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, your host for the show, and the president of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. On today's show, we have Master Husin Alexander, a longtime martial arts competitor and instructor from Southern Vermont. I've known Master Alexander since we were kids on the tournament circuit back in the 90s. He's doing great things for the martial arts in New England, so I thought he'd be a good choice for our very first episode. He's got some exciting stories to tell, and I had a wonderful time hearing them. I hope you enjoy them too. Master Alexander, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks for having me. Well, um, really excited to have you on today. You've got quite a bit of history, so let's, let's just jump right into it. Tell us about your pass with martial arts well I, uh, I, I started young um, my uh, my instructor uh, grandmaster Ed Bud uh, did an after-school program here in a small town of London area Vermont and uh, I got started in uh, in first grade I was five um, and you know, it was his his first ever black belt out of an after-school program um, I also trained in his Winchester school as well uh, but that's that sort of came from uh, just an after school program in London area Vermont later to take it over from him when I was 16 wow okay so ha- what about the 11 years in between that I did uh, I was on his uh, junior national team after uh, the AKL and the PKL faded away there um, I was on the AKL junior national team, um, and then they kind of disappeared, and my instructor started the Bud Lights, uh, B-U-D-D. <laughs> I, re- uh, I remember that. Yeah, and, uh, and we traveled all you know across the country and uh, had a lot of fun experiencing you know the United States and, and Canada. We went up to to Canada and competed in a bunch of tournaments and. Uh, really enjoying what martial arts brought to us as a family. Um, you know, of course my immediate family, my parents were, were at a lot of those events. Um, but even when they weren't between my instructor and the rest of the team, I mean, they were like brothers and sisters. Uh, we spent so much time together. Uh, sure. It was just, it, it, it was a lot of fun. Had a lot of fun in the, in the competition world and and training and a lot of times um, we'd do, we'd stop and do do demos. Mr. Bud would have uh, demos or seminars set up and you know, we'd on our way to Bangor, Maine, and we'd swing into a high school or a college that he had lined up and we'd do a little bit of a, a demo for you know, one of his students that has a school in the area or, or what have you. Um, so. Very busy incorporating martial arts into everyday life. Okay, so let's keep going a little bit. There you are. You're 16. You've been competing all over for a few years. You take over a martial arts school. You're still in high school, I assume, at that point. Yep. So you're balancing running a business long before pretty much anybody does. Right, yeah. The the funny thing was I had to have – my mother used to come and sit in on classes because, um, you know, I had to have an, an adult present for insurance purposes. Uh, right. So my mother would come and sit in on classes. I was, I was renting um, right here in the Londonderry Plaza. Uh, the guy that owns the, the shopping market here, um, he uh, he was nice enough to help me get started. And uh, we worked off a percentage. Rent was a percentage of the students that uh, – that paid tuition um, started out as one class a week and then broke it up into two classes a week and opened up uh, or took over I should say uh, an after school program in Chester as well so yeah I was going to school during the day and then I a lot of times I'd get out of school a little bit early to come and teach and then go back and during soccer season and hit up varsity soccer and then leave soccer practice a little early to go and teach, uh, go and teach another class. Wow. So you, you were a busy kid in high school, weren't you? Was busy. Yeah. It was good. <laughs> kept, kept us out of trouble though. That's good. All right. So what about after, after high school, you 
kept doing that? Did you go away and come back? Or no, actually, I I, uh, I had the opportunity. I was pretty good at soccer. Um, I had the opportunity to get a, a, a full scholarship to Franklin Pierce College um, and, and play for them over there. But I had my three schools going here at that point in time. I had one in Bells Falls, uh, one in Chester, and then the one here in Lunnendary. Um And I just had a really, really hard time to say yes and, and drop those students and and go away to college for four years or, or whatever, um, pursuing, you know, the stalker dream of all about me. Um, you know, if I was to do that, there wasn't anybody else coming to Londonderry, Chester, or Bellis Falls, Vermont to teach people martial arts. So they would have been their martial arts life would be over. Uh, mm. So it was That's it was really challenging, but I you know, I ended up, I think, making the right decision. It, it sounds like you did. Do you ever look back and do you ever have regrets? Um, I don't know. Over that? I don't know about regrets. I mean, who wants to play for Team USA in the Olympics or something, you know? Right. <laughs> who wants to be Nobody... World Cups? Right. Yeah, I wouldn't no, say that's... regrets, though, but I, I definitely, you know, I think about it, and especially my son's six now, and, and he's he's a pretty good athlete, and we're messing around out back with a soccer ball, and, you know, I played some men's league soccer when I could when I wasn't teaching or away at a tournament with the team or something. Um, but I, you know, I kind of gave up that competitive soccer and, you know, messing around with my son out back. I'm like, man, I don't know, maybe, maybe I should have, but I look at everything that it's done. Martial arts itself is done for me. And, you know, the, the people that I've met and things I've had the opportunity to do and be a part of. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't think, Pursuing soccer would have been as you know, exciting as as you might think, not compared to what I've been able to accomplish here. Sure, sure. So I know that you've spent a lot of time competing. I mean, we we didn't even really get into the competition that you've done in once you got into your twenties and thirties with the full contact stuff and and all the travel that you've done. Mm -hmm. um, any great stories out of that you might want to pull? Um, yeah, we had, um, you know, the b biggest thing for me was I was always, I always wanted to be challenged. Um, you know, I, I was, was competing on the, uh, you know, the national level, um, going to, going around to tournaments and, uh, one of Kyle Gilbert was, was one of those, uh, hard nosed competitors, him and I, I'd get first, he'd get second, uh, he'd get first, I'd get second. We, we kind of went back and forth uh, pretty consistently for a while there. And then uh, that was when I was like 15. And then the, tour, the the school came up and I realized how how much how much more it was to see a student get fourth place than it was for me to win grants. Um, mm. So I stopped competing and and really focused on trying to give – them that opportunity to 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 win a trophy and and feel good about their hard training and, and accomplishment um and i did that until uh, 18 19 i didn't didn't compete maybe once or twice here or there um i'd throw the gear on and jump in and, and compete uh and then i got an invitation to go to the uh the us kba world championships down in uh new jersey it was down in, mm -hmm. in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, so I, I thought about it, and I said, oh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do some training, see how it goes, um, so I basically trained myself to do uh, to do full contact, and uh, I went down there, competed in the continuous, uh, won the continuous um, middleweight division, and then... Uh, I'm sorry, light heavyweight division, and then I won the middleweight um, full contact division. I had my my cousin who knew nothing about fighting uh, as my corner guy, so you know, <laughs> just give me some water in between rounds, um, and I'll take care of the rest. But you know that was that was a lot of fun doing that. Um, I was able to bring you know some family with me down there, cousins and stuff. And they hadn't really been out of Vermont, so for them to, you know, ride down to Newark, New Jersey, they definitely got a culture shock 
Uh, a little bit of a different area. A little for sure. bit of a different area, yeah. They, you know, around here we had the tough guy, quote unquote, gangs with their hats backwards. Um, and then uh, you go down to Newark, New Jersey, and you actually see one. <laughs> right. They, they were they were uh, definitely into a culture shock, but and from there I I got uh, Paul Rosner was the president of the USKBA and. Uh, um, Bruce Marshall, who was the martial arts promoter, sport martial arts promoter in the Revere area, Revere, Mass., uh, he started promoting mixed martial arts and kickboxing. Um, and he got me, uh, he got me a New England title shot. So I fought, uh, Richie Feliciano, who was a, a cop from down in Long Island area. And I fought him. He was the New England, New England title holder in the super middleweight division. Uh, Fought him and beat him a uh, unanimous decision. Wow. To, to win the now, New England title. Now, I think we might have glossed over a piece here where you really didn't have a whole lot of full contact experience at this point. Am I, am I right? No. You grew up doing point fighting, yeah. so, you know, a little yeah. bit more traditional yeah. point fighting, and just jumped in with your feet to this full contact kick, kickboxing stuff. Yeah, I mean, and, and, I mean, full contact was definitely the better place for me. I mean, Mr. Bud, you know, is Mudokan style taekwondo. Um, but I'm not built for Taekwondo at all. I mean, I had to really adapt, um, myself to, to be a, a Taekwondo stylist. I mean, I'm more of a, more of a Shotokan, uh, stand there and then hit them hard type, type person. Move, I move quick, but, um, you know, that fancy jump and spin, I had to work really hard to, to get all that stuff into my repertoire. Uh, I mean, it's been great now, and it, and it really helped me a lot in the full contact world, because um, that's what people would assume when we stepped between the ropes was that I was this, you know, this big puncher, big kicker, nothing fancy, and um, you know, I, I, I did have that fancy in my my bag of tricks. So, um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Not a whole lot of experience, but it worked out. When we were talking about your your time in high school, doing soccer, training, teaching students, you know, with your own school, you you hinted that there was a lot that the martial arts had done for you, and that you wanted to make sure you were giving back. Can you tell us a little bit more what what would you say the martial arts has done for you? No, well, I mean the, the biggest thing that martial arts did for me is it uh, you know it taught me that self control. Um, as a kid growing up, my parents wanted to get me into martial arts because um, I, I had a very short fuse. Um, you know, somebody, the kid would bump into me on the bus and I'd you know, just grab right a hold of him. Um, a very, very short temper and, uh, you know, I, some hard lessons, classes that uh, I wasn't able to attend. I, I used to have to sit and watch, which was absolute torture. Um, and something that I use in, in my school today uh, when parents, my child misbehaves and, and isn't following the rules of my school, uh, I strongly encourage the parents to have them suit up and sit in the back of class because if you're not there and you don't see what's going on, it doesn't bother you as much. But when you have to come to class, see what's going on, and you really want to be participating and you can't participate, um, it, really, it really tears at you, especially – us martial artists that absolutely love every piece of it. Um, you know, so I, I think that you know, the biggest thing for me was the, the self control. Um, I was, a, I was a very good athlete in most everything I did. So the confidence stuff, um, it definitely helped with some of the confidence, but I never really, I never really had, the worst, you know, I was never the worst batter, or never the worst soccer player, or, um, never the worst thrower. Uh, so I, I never lacked that kind of confidence that martial arts brings to a lot of people. But the, um, you know, the the ability to be able to play because I wasn't in trouble for for fighting or for back talking and being disrespectful, um, you know that. That uh, that self control was a huge piece, um, and I see it in a lot of students that that come through my door today, um, and just uh, you know say, "Yep, oh, there I am." There, there's there's a hope. You know, there is a hope. 
I think it's great that you bring up, you know, two different facets that people often ascribe to the martial arts, the the self-control, the discipline, but also the, the confidence in that when I look at martial arts, when I talk to parents about martial arts and why maybe their child should be in martial arts, why they themselves should be in martial arts, there are so many different aspects to martial arts, and not everyone's going to need everything that the martial arts can provide. Right. But everyone can see some benefit, and, and usually tremendous benefit from spending some time with the martial arts. So I think it's, it's great that you, you make that, that distinction there. How about, you know, we talked about a lot of positive stuff. How about a, a low point? Was there something in your life at any time where you can look back and say, you know, I was able to handle this differently or it, the outcome was different because of my experience in the martial arts? Um, you know, I'm not, not really sure. I mean, I think one of the, one of the lowest points that I had was probably when I was like eight. Um, not that I remember it like it's yesterday, but, um, you know, I remember still struggling with that, with the temper and, um, you know, sitting out for three classes in a row because of my behavior in school or what have you. Um, and being like, you know what? I, I don't need this. I, I don't. I don't want to do this anymore because I can't do it anyway. Um, but with the help from my instructor and my parents saying, you know, you know, you're good at this. We need to make sure that you are able to continue to do this, and you know, your your behavior is preventing you from being able to. Uh, you know, so as far as you know that. Teenage to young adult midlife problem I was able to persevere through, and I think it happened when I was eight. Um, I mean, I've definitely been I've been in some some boxing matches where you know I was hit real hard and had to you know use some of that that martial arts. This is nothing like my black belt test mindset, uh, you know to to struggle through that last 30 seconds and clear the cobwebs in between rounds. Um, I've, I've definitely done that. Uh, had to use, use my black belt test as my own, my own personal uh, kick in the butt, so to speak. Um, it's my the black belt test that Mr. Bud uh, used to make us go through was pretty intense and grueling. <laughs> You want to tell us a little bit more about that? I know, know in some schools it's you, you can't talk about it. Yeah, Are you sure. able I'm, to share anything more? Yeah, we we, uh, we used to start. I mean, I tested when I was 11 for my black belt, and my test was no different than, um, you know, Miss Rulo when when she went through it, uh, Grandmaster Rulo, or you know, a, a 25 year old just getting out of the Marines. I went through the same exact test. Um, and you start off with a two mile run. Back then, you had to be done in, in 20 minutes or less. Um, from there, you came into your 500 push ups. You couldn't move on to anything else till your push ups were done. Then 500 sit ups and uh, 750 side kicks with each leg. Then you sat down to a two page written test. And then you'd start your up and down the floor with all your hand techniques and then your kicks and your jump spin kicks. Um, and then into your forms, obviously with the black belt board asking to see anything they wanted over again. Um, from forms, we went into hand-to-hand -hand self defense and takedowns, into board breaking, and then finishing the day with sparring one on one against everybody on the board, then two on ones, then three on ones, and then board on tester. Wow. How, now, when you did your break, test, your test was over. <laughs> okay. Was it just you, or were you in a group? Uh, I was actually I was supposed to be testing with. Um, uh, at the point in time, he was the the head of the uh, the the Keen SWAT team um, uh, sniper coach, uh, but. Something serious came up, and he wasn't able to test that day, so I ended up testing by myself that day. So you're solo with all all those different 
I expect very difficult elements. I mean, it's very easy to quantify 500 push-ups. A little bit harder to quantify forms. Yeah. But how long did that test test take? Uh, we we started at it was 8 a.m. I don't remember looking at the clock, but I know it was dinner time when we were done. Well, somewhere in the four four to five. And if you wanted a break to take a sip of water or go to the bathroom, bow out, and we'll try this again another day. Um, you know, like I said, really? yeah, very, very hard, very hard nose test. Um, but it was, you know, times were different. Sure. Time, times were different. I mean, now you could never get away with that. There's no way that you you could, as and, and you know, as we've developed as uh, human beings and realize how important staying hydrated is to the function of the brain and the body. Um, you know, taking that quick rest. Uh, you know, it's not healthy to do what we used to do. <laughs> not physically, that's for not sure. at all. But again, like I used to use it in my fights. You know, this is nothing compared to my black belt test, and I lived through that. So let's go. Come on, you got two more rounds. Suck it up. I I do the same thing when I had a difficult part in my life, uh, and I think that was the intention was that our instructors gave us that gift right. to say, "Hey, if you can make it through this, you can make it through anything." Right, exactly. And, and you know, as I say to my students, right now you think that you're gonna die when you're at a four. You still got a ten in you. You're four. And you've just never been pushed beyond it. You always give up first or take a break first. Um, that, our, you know, our black belt test introduces you to what you are really capable of digging deep, finding another gear and pushing forward. Um, you, know, you thought you were done at that level four, but you got a 10. There is a 10 in there. We just you got to know that it's there. And until you feel it, until you've uh, you know, been, a, been uh, a part of that, you don't know. You know, oh, I once heard, yeah, I once heard one of my instructors say that the test, your black belt test, didn't start until you wanted to quit. That's right. Yeah, I like that. So let's move on. You've you've mentioned quite a few names uh, of people that you've you've trained with or trained under that that helped you get going. But could you identify one of them? And of course, the obvious answer would would be Master Bud, the the man that got you started. But so let's take him out of the mix. Someone that was instrumental in your your martial arts upbringing. Uh, Mr. Bud out, huh? Um, geez, there's been there has been a lot. There has been a lot. Um, as far and, and I think it's. It's tough because I, I I've been you know I've worked with uh, a lot of, you know guys in the military with combatives and, and, and ground fighting and that's where my jujitsu end came from um, not from a, a traditional jujitsu school but through the combatives of, of the military um, not that I was in the military but I worked with the, you know worked with a uh, military sure sure um, instructors um, you know the boxing Jimmy Farrell Jimmy Farrell was my boxing coach. Um, I mean, he was huge. I mean, the stars aligned guy, you know, he used to train with, with custom auto, um, Mike Tyson's trainer. And, uh, that's the punch system that I know the same punch system that, uh, that Mike does, you know, that, that he used, that he used to use, um, the, the pendulum head moving system. That's a, that's all the cus, custom auto system that, that I used when I've fought. Um, so if, if we were to, get some tape of you and some tape of Mike Tyson and watch them side by side, we'd see some similarities? Most definitely, especially if you're listening oh, to call-outs because wow. Cuss had a, had a different punch number system. You know, so when you say, you know, so instead of saying jab straight, um, you know, it was 7-2 it was where most people, 1-2, one, 1-2, two, 1-2. One, two, one, two. Uh, it was 7-2. The custom model system is 7-2 for the jab straight. Um you know, so numbers numbers are a lot faster to rifle off than they are to you know jab straight. Uh, sure. So, you know, seven two one, seven two one, seven two one is wide open. Look at seven two one. They go. He throw the six. Um, you know. So how do you, 
How did you get a chance to hook up with him? <laughs> I'm just it was an absolute freak accident. Um, there was this there was this uh, tavern uh, hotel up here in Magic Mountain, the ski area, because uh, London is right here in, in the middle of all the Stratton, Okemo, Bromley, Magic, um, and Jimmy's very good friend um, bought it and asked Jimmy if he would manage it. So Jimmy was up here, and uh, we were in the tavern one night, and uh, he came up to, he came up to me and uh, was talking about kickboxing, and one of his fighters was there getting ready for an ESPN2 fight. Um, Martin Thornton, a guy from, from Ireland, was going to fight uh, Bobo Starnino on ESPN2. And... Uh, they didn't have much sparring up here on Indiary, so he's like, "Would you, would you be interested in giving giving Martin some some sparring?" I'm like, "Ah, I've never boxed. I uh, kick kickbox, but you know that was self taught. Because uh, at that point in time, I had already I defended my um, New England title, uh, giving Feliciano a rematch, but I knocked him out this time, um, which gave me the next step to." fight for the u.s title but that's a different day <laughs> uh, um so anyway so i agreed to it and we went down here to my my school in londonderry and and i went uh went five rounds with thornton um who was a heavy punch he was number two middleweight in new england when the new england uh there was a new england uh pro boxing rating and uh and thornton was number two uh, so how'd that go Horrible, <laughs> horrible. You, uh, you get knocked around a little bit. A lot. You got knocked around a lot, but uh, <laughs> Jimmy told me afterwards the the worst part was that uh, Thornton drops everybody in the gym. He said that his goal is to make sure that he drops you when he's sparring. He, that's what that's what his goal is, and I wouldn't go down. So I wish you would have told me that on the first round. I would have taken a knee, and then it would have been an easier day. But I was just like, oh, I, I agreed to this. I am not going to let him, you know, not going to let him think that I can't handle this. So I just kept gritting it, and, it, you know, yeah. But, I mean, Martin and, and I, since, you know, after that, Thornton and I probably sparred 150 rounds. Oh, that that's great. That's great. So you proved yourself and earned his respect. Yeah. And- yeah, and then, and then you got Jimmy, some coaching out of it. Yeah, Jimmy said, "Hey, you want a box?" He said, "I can get you some fights. I'll get you get you a fight right up here and advertise." So we ended up my first my first fight was actually at Dostal's there at Magic out back in the tennis court. Uh, we threw a ring up, and I don't remember the guy's name. He came up came up from uh, Boston area somewhere. Um, he was three and all or something, and. Uh, I ended up getting a referee stoppage second round on that one. Um, and that was my first fight before Golden Gloves. Wow. So just to be clear, the referee stopped the fight because you were hammering him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah I had him up against the rope. There, there's a bit of a pattern here for you. If, if, if you. I'm sure you've seen it, and I'm sure the listeners are picking up on it. You, you try something, and you do well at it. Yeah, well, I, I think, think my biggest thing is I don't I don't like to not be good. <laughs> well, that's you know, I think it's that that warrior spirit, warrior will, whatever you want to call it. Different people call it different things, and it's pretty clear that you have it, and it's it's coming through. You know, as we're talking, it's very clear that anything you're going to set your mind to, you're going to come out having accomplished accomplished it. You know, whatever your goals are. And I think yeah. that's great, and I think that's really inspiring for the rest of us to listen to you talk. Well, I think the biggest thing is, you know, I, I look at everything as, um, you know, one of my, my really good friends, um, Ross Ross Powers, is the first U.S. Olympic snowboarder to, to medal, um, and then the, the next Olympics he won gold when we had a, a three-medal sweep in the men's half fight, but, you know, I would look at little Vermont and you know, little Londonderry, Vermont, and, uh, you know, seeing what he was able to do at, at a world level. And at that point in time, I was coming up through, um, in the full contact ranks, you know, I was 
I won the New England title, defended it, got a shot for the United States title, and and won that. You know, so I was I was on my way up through there. He he was uh, all over TV, all over uh, the newspapers, and you know, whenever he he'd drive by my house if I was outside, you know, he's swinging in and we're talking. Uh, we played a lot of golf together. We played on a men's league together, and him and I would would ride up and and play eighteen holes before the actual nine hole men's league started. Um, and, and we talk a lot about that. How it's just uh, you know that that never say die mentality attitude. Um, you say I can't do it. Okay, we'll watch this. You know, pull up a chair. Yeah, that's. I think that's awesome, and I think that that's something that comes through a lot with with the martial arts you know you know a lot of martial artists i know a lot of martial artists most of the people listening to this show are martial artists and it's something that most of us have seen multiple times is that attitude and it's something that i think is conditioned through the martial arts and it's one of my favorite things about the martial arts is that that lifting up to the next level of of attitude of perseverance whatever you want to call it but that that focusing on a goal and getting it yeah so that that's awesome um it's a new movie it's just coming out right now if if you can believe it you can achieve it or something right yeah yeah i thought that was i I like that it hits hits the martial arts right on top absolutely so you've trained with a lot of people but if you could train with Anyone that you haven't, be they living or dead, who would that be? Whew. Yeah, that's tough too. I mean, again, it's like that. If it was to be boxing, it'd be I'd love to train with Muhammad in, in his prime. Uh, if it was you know kickboxing, I, I'd love to uh, get in there with Benny the Jet. You know, and again, not just not just training and having them hold mitts or tell me how to hit the bay. I mean, I want to spar with these guys, you know? Sure. Um, you know, in the point martial arts, you know, I, I'd like to spar with Bill Wallace in his prime, uh, mm. you know, Chuck Norris, Jeff Smith, those guys in their, in their prime, um, would just be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I also would have loved to have done those things, but I think you would have stood a much better shot at not getting your block taken off. Than I, I would. don't know about that. You weren't too shabby yourself. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, how about a, a favorite martial arts flick? Any films that pop pop into mind? As- yeah, I mean, how can you go wrong? I mean, you got Bloodsport and Kickboxer on top. I would have to say. Okay. I like like that like those two Van Damme films that you know. I'm, not just about watching it, but knowing a little bit more of the history um, between the. I mean, he got Van Dam got like fifteen hundred dollars, I think, was the number for all for three films. That's it. Yeah, three, huh. for a three film deal. It was uh, Bloodsport, Kickboxer, and I. I want to say Cyborg was the third one. Mm. Oh, I forgot about that one. That was a that, that was a little bit rough. Yeah. Uh, but blood blood sport they weren't even gonna they weren't even gonna do they weren't gonna release it he went in and I, he spent like four days straight re-editing the whole thing and then he brought it back to him and they said yeah they'd do it well he, so is he your your favorite martial arts actor well no I, I don't know i mean he's a, he was a, a a great actor and i think he really helped um show people the you know the the side of martial arts that wasn't the C- Steven Seagal. You know, cause I like Steven Seagal because he's so true. You know, he's not going to do the you know the Van Dam jump s- split kick. You know, jump sp- split kick into yep. the you know kick in the head so your head hits the tomb or whatever. You know, Seagal is going to grab you, grab you by the hair, take his thumb and stick you in the eye. You know, I mean, because that's right. what you would really do if you were defending yourself. Um, you know, grab your arm, a little forearm break, uh, nothing. Nothing Jackie Chanish, but that's all got its place. And I think Van Dam was the one that kind of broke through to that and showed that martial arts is just absolutely amazing. Um, not just to defend yourself, but some of these techniques, you know, when they're done correctly, look awesome. 
Yeah. I think, you know, I think Van Dam was the one that kind of broke that, broke that out. Um, you know, that's where the Jackie Chans and the Jet Lees came from. That fancy martial arts came from, you know, Van Dam breaking through with it. I, I would agree. Absolutely. So as we're, we're going to start wrapping up now, but one more question for you. Do you have any goals, any martial arts related goals for the future that you'd be willing to share with us? Um, yeah, I, I'd say physical goals. No, I don't, I don't really have any physical goals right now. I'm not looking to, to compete again. Um, you know, if, if I got, uh, if I did get the, the phone call from De La Hoya saying, hey, we'd like to put you, put you in, we got, we got you, we got you in for a pay-per-view fight, a real life Rocky story. Um, take a look at the numbers on this check. I might take it. Uh, but, That'd be hard to say no yeah, to, wouldn't it? But you know, I'm not. I'm really not looking to to compete. I mean, I still I still train. I work with my my MMA fighters, my kickboxers. Um, you know, every night I, I'm still sparring every night, and that gives me just enough taste uh, so that I don't want to you know get in there and mix it up anymore. And, and my body took a lot of abuse. Lots and lots of abuse for uh, when I went into the full contact world. Um, I was in there with great guys, some really, really, really good high name um, pros, and uh, you know, just some of those sparring matches were thousands times worse than any match that I was in. Uh, they were tough. They were real tough. Uh, but it, again, it was you know. Fun stuff, you know, being in there sparring with John Scully and uh, Nick Morganelli, Martin Thornton. Um, you know, those those guys are just real, really good fighters, and I wouldn't replace it for anything. Um, but it, it took its toll, and uh, now I think more of my goals are in the having other people grow, um, helping with where I've been, who I know, what I've done. Um, being able to, to make those connections so that, you know, people can take the reins. Um, you know, it's with the Twin State Martial Arts Association working with EPON to help make the, the sport martial arts world a little bit bigger in, in the Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, my whole purpose for starting Twin State Martial Arts was because I was never a state martial arts champion. There was nothing to say that I was. Um, was I the best in Vermont? Oh, sure, maybe, but there was nothing to say that I was the state champion. Um, so we we really needed a a circuit for Vermont, for New Hampshire to say, you know what, your friends are skiers or tennis players, and and they're individually they're state champions because there was a system in place to recognize that. Um, you know, and that's that's what I wanted to do with, with Twin State, give these. You know, these kids and adults, the opportunity to say, you know what, I am the Twin State champion. Uh, I am the best in, in Vermont uh, for the year 2008. Did I beat everybody? No, I didn't beat everybody, but I put the time in to represent at every single tournament that there was recognizing these people. Um, it's not like it's closed door and we only advertise within two or three schools. Um, you know, Twin State's open to anybody. Any competitor, and just like the Epon circuit, it's open to any competitor. Um, so if you want to come in and improve your skills, you're welcome. Come on. Um, I think that's really my 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 goals for the future is to just continue finding other ways to help other martial artists broaden you know broaden the horizon and uh, you know like this this podcast here you know. Hopefully, you know, pe more and more people, um, you know, tune into the to the podcast and uh, you know start start learning some stuff uh, from each guest that you have on there. And if they can take a little something away from this interview, then you know, mission accomplished. I, I hope so too. And listeners, we're going to have links to the Twin State Circuit and the Epon Circuit in the show notes. Um, so that, that's a lot of what you're, you kind of led into the, the last question that we have really is what you've got going on right now. Um, 
anything else that you want to promote? Anything you want listeners to know about? Team Rapid Force, sponsored by Whistlekick. <laughs> um, yeah, they, uh, well, this is our first year with Team Rapid Force, um, with national national team, um, well, world and national team, going to some of these world world events at Crane and Nazca. Um, I mean, right now it's uh, my students that wanted to accept the challenge and and uh, go out there and broaden our horizons. They've proven themselves to be uh, worthy competitors, but hoping that we can branch out here next year and continue to have whistle kick and and rapid force um, as sponsors of the team and and get uh, get some competitors from other schools to join our join our force and, and represent our sponsors. Well, you know, I'll take the opportunity to publicly thank you for for allowing us to sponsor Team Rapid Force. It's a it's a good group of kids and adults that you have there and watching what they've been doing on the circuits and and the significant amount of hardware that they've been taking home has been pretty impressive. But Thanks. let's say somebody wants to get a hold of you whether it's they, you know, they they think they would be a good addition to the team or they, you know, heard something that they want to talk to you about. How can people reach you? Yeah. I mean, they, they can, uh, they can email me. You could throw the email up there. Um, okay. Yep. We'll they throw that in the show notes. Or, or they can call, um, you know, contact team rapid force on, on Facebook. Um, you know, if, if that's, if that's something that they want to do, we can sit down and talk. Um, you know, there's, there's more to it than wearing the uniform. There's other, other uh, criteria that they, uh, as far as being a, a good respectful martial artist, um, it comes a part of that. Uh, we're not looking. Sure. We're not looking to just have Team Rapid Force uniforms on the podium, so to speak. Uh, right. We want, uh, and I'm sure as you, as as the founder of Whistlekick, would much rather have people come up and say, you know, everybody on that Team Rapid Force is just so respectful and. Great competitors, fun to be around. Just, just nice, nice martial artists, um, and that's that's way more important to us as traditional martial artists and coaches than the person that's going to get gold all the time. But nobody wants to talk to them. Couldn't agree more. Well, yeah. So we'll have that contact information in the show notes at, at the website was kickmartialartsradio dot com. Um, so great. Any any last thoughts before we sign off? Go out and get your whistle kick gear. <laughs> <laughs> I did not tell him to say the that. The best stuff on earth. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We're trying. Uh, well, Master Alexander, really appreciate your time, and thanks for being on Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. You bet. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. A big thank you to Master Alexander for appearing on our first ever episode. Please be sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss one of our weekly episodes. If you like the show, we'd appreciate a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you'd like to learn more about what we offer at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel, check us out at whistlekick.com. Train hard and have a great day.